Welcome everyone to tonight's SN1, SN2, E1, E2 pre-finals practice session. Before I jump into practice problems, let's just do a quick overview of the four-part checklist that I teach in one of my newest YouTube videos on how to choose between SN1, SN2, E1, and E2 reactions. The checklist is as follows. The first thing we're going to look at is the alkyl chain. Now this is just a quick review, we don't have time to go through it in detail. In the alkyl chain, we're looking at the alpha carbon. This is the one that holds the leaving group, and we're asking, is this stable enough to hold a carbocation? Yes or no? That will help us with SN1 and E1 reactions. Can I do a nucleophilic attack? That will tell us about SN2 reactions. Doesn't tell us anything for elimination. The second thing we're going to look at is the beta carbon, the carbon that is next to the alpha carbon. So if I have a molecule that looks like this, with a leaving group right here, this is my alpha and this is my beta. This will give us a direction of what kind of reaction can potentially take place. The next thing we're going to look at is the attacker. I'm less interested in the difference between a nucleophile and a base. I'm more interested in the difference between strong and weak, which will tell us between a one-type and a two-type reaction. A one-type reaction, SN1E1, is a slow reaction with a weak attacker. A two-type reaction, SN2 or E2, is a fast reaction with a strong, typically negative attacker. The next thing we're going to look at is the solvent. And I want to see if it's polar protic or aprotic. This will help us figure out if we can do an SN2 or E2 in a two-type reaction, because the one-type reactions prefer to have the protic solvents, given that we need to stabilize the carbocation intermediate. If we have a protic solvent and a two-type reaction, we favor E2. A protic is going to favor SN2. And last but not least, we're looking at the leaving group, and this is more of a yes-no question. Is the leaving group good enough to leave? If not, how do we get rid of it, or can we not get rid of it at all? So with this, let's do a couple of warm-up problems. I'm going to grab this checklist so we can work through it with the problems. All right, let's start with a warm-up problem to apply the checklist. Something very simple. If I give you a starting molecule with a chlorine drawn on a wedge, and I ask you to react it with NASH and DMSO, what type of reaction is going to take place, and then Based on that, what is the actual product? I'll keep this here for you on the side. And what we're looking for is to, de is to determine if we have SN1, SN2, E1, or E2. And I'm less interested in figuring out which product it's going to be, or which reaction is going to take place. More interested in figuring out which one I can rule out, because then I'll be left with the actual answer rather than having to be confused about it. So what do I have? The alkyl chain has my leaving group on a secondary carbon. Secondary doesn't rule out anything because I can have a carbocation and I can have a substitution reaction with an SN2. That's for the alpha. The beta, I have two of them, whatever. They, they don't tell me much except that an E reaction can take place. Next, we're going to look at the t attacker. NaSH looks neutral, but if you recognize Na plus is a positive spectator, get rid of it. SH minus is a negative attacker. Negative means a two-type reaction, a strong reaction. If you have a negative attacker, you're not going to form carbocation intermediates. We automatically just ruled out SN1 and E1. Then we look at the solvent. The solvent DMSO is aprotic. Polar aprotic is going to favor an SN2 over an E2 reaction, and leaving group of chlorine will leave. No problems there. To do an SN2 reaction, the nucleophile is going to do a backside attack, kick out the chlorine. Does that mean I put my SH, my incoming nucleophile, on dashes, wedges, or a straight line? This is a trick question. The answer is I put it on a straight line because the product is achiral. The starting molecule is also achiral because I have symmetry in the molecule. Symmetry, I do not have four unique substituents. 
That means it's achiral. So even though it's a backside attack, in this case, it doesn't matter. I have an achiral product. Let's look at a similar starting molecule. Again, a three carbon chain. This time I'll give you bromine on a wedge and we'll react it with NaOH in H2O. Let's take a look at our checklist and see what we have. My alkyl chain, just like before, I have the leaving group sitting on a secondary carbon, doesn't let me rule out anything, and I know that I have beta carbons present, that means I could do an elimination if I have to. My attacker in this case, if Na plus is a positive spectator, I have OH minus. Oxygen is a strong negative attacker. Strong. It's not waiting for a carbocation to form. That means we are going to rule out our SN1 and E1 reactions. I'm left between SN2 and E2. Take a look at the solvent. The solvent is protic. A protic solvent is one that is capable of forming hydrogen bonding, and water is the perfect example of hydrogen bonding. This is not going to be happy with an SN2 reaction. It is going to favor the E2 reaction. So the H plus is a source of protons. It's an acid catalyst, but it doesn't exist in a vacuum. Anytime you see H2SO4 and no solvent is given, the water, H2O, is implied. That means you have water. That also doesn't give me an attacker. It still just gives me my solvent. That means if you don't have a solvent, especially if you have an acidic solution, that is a salvolysis reaction. Salvolysis, salvolysis. The solvent is going to participate. The solvent is your attacker. Water is the attacker. Water is neutral. It's weak. It's not strong enough to kick anything out. That means it has to wait for bromine to leave on its own. It has to wait for a carbocation to form. And that means we rule out SN2 and E2 because those are fast reactions and we have a slow reaction happening right here. So that also covers the solvent. A polar protic solvent is going to help stabilize charged intermediates, which is great for SN1 and E1. It's also great for E2, so don't rule that out. But we ruled it out because H2O is weak, so a different reason. Then we look at the leaving group. The leaving group is a good leaving group. It's gone. But we have not differentiated between SN1 and E1. And that is because these two reactions are always in competition. And so the answer is that we're going to have both. SN1 and E1 will be the products in this reaction. So what happens? Bromine is going to leave first to give me, let's work our way downward so we have more room, is going to give me a carbocation intermediate. Now this is not going to impact the product, but technically I don't have an attack yet because the trick that I teach in my carbocation rearrangement video is as follows. Anytime you have a secondary carbocation near a tertiary carbon, you're going to have a hydride shift. This hydrogen is going to jump over to that secondary carbon to give me a more stable carbocation intermediate, which now looks like this. I have the CH3 here and the carbocation sitting at that tertiary more substituted more stable position. Now water is going to come in and attack. And this will give me my near final product with an O, an H, an H, one lone pair, positive charge, and we're going to have to wind our way back up the page because I'm out of room. In the last step, another water molecule is going to come in, grab that proton, give oxygen back the electrons. Actually, that works out nicely because then we can just put our product up there. Whoops, I'm showing you the SN1 product. We need two products, so let's keep 
room on the page for both. So I'll put that one here. Okay, so that is my first product. This is SN1. I'll do the E1 product in a different color. So at this point, if instead of attacking the carbocation, water is choosing to come in and grab a hydrogen instead, same intermediate, it's just a different part of the molecule that gets attacked, that will give me, we'll squeeze it in up here, my E1 product with a pi bond sitting right over there. There we go. Two products, one for SN1, one for E1, both in competition. If you have any questions on this, go ahead and type it in. If you just joined us to get a copy, a link to the recording for tonight's session, a copy of the notes and the worksheet, check out the pinned comment. Go to layerforsci.com slash or go live, sign up, and you'll get it as soon as I'm done. Also, if you're not yet subscribed to my channel, what are you waiting for? Go ahead and hit that subscribe button so that you don't miss out on any upcoming live sessions. And let's crank it up a notch. Say, instead of giving you a starting molecule, you're asked to come up with a starting molecule, and you are told that you reacted under the following conditions. NaOH, acetone, and you have a product that looks like this. So the two things you're being asked for is one, the reaction that took place, and two, one, we want the reaction, and two, we want the starting molecule, the alkyl halide that reacted with NaOH and acetone to give us that product. Before answering this, I see a couple of questions. Why did we get both? Because SN1 and E1 are always in competition. There's nothing here that is going to favor one over the other. If you see heat in a reaction, then it does tend to favor elimination over substitution, but you'll still have competition between the two of them. There's no... Oh yeah, I gave you the major product. This is the Sev's product. It's more substituted. The minor product, which you're not really going to see here, but the minor product would look like this. The same carbon skeleton, but this time the pi bond is going to be on the less substituted carbon, like that. That will be the less substituted, therefore minor. And this one I'm just going to put major so that you have the difference. Great question. Uh, Kevin Kenneth, I don't understand your question. It's a good leaving group, but if water didn't attack the backside, why did it leave? Okay, so the leaving group in an SO1 reaction leaves on its own because you have a highly electronegative atom that even though it's neutral, is pulling and pulling and pulling on the electrons between itself and carbon until it pulls so hard that it happens to pop off and just wander off somewhere in solution. All right, so going back to this problem, the first thing you want to recognize is that if there is no pi bond, if there's no pi, it's not an elimination reaction, not E1, not E2, and so it had to be a substitution reaction, right, because I have no pi bond, I didn't eliminate. If it's substitution, then find the group that looks like it could have been your nucleophile, and then ask yourself, did I go a one-type or a two-type reaction? If I did a two-type reaction, this is the nucleophile with a negative charge. If it was a one-type reaction, then it's the nucleophile, but you have to add a hydrogen on there. Well, let's... Oh, wow, I gave that to you, so it's actually easier than I was trying to make it out to be. I already know that Na plus positive spectator OH minus is negative, it's strong, and that means it has to be a two-type reaction. We know it's not elimination, so the answer to part one is an SN2 reaction. Again, if we have no pi bond in the product and a strong attacker, it's not elimination, it's substitution, and it had to be SN2. What would give us this product in an SN2 reaction? 
The trick is to draw out the carbon skeleton and then simply reverse the stereochemistry. If my nucleophile is on a wedge, then my leaving group had to be on dashes because SN2 gives us an inversion of chirality and the opposite of a wedge is chlorine on dashes. Why chlorine? Because that's the one I happen to choose. If you're told alkyl halide, use chlorine, bromine, or iodine, they're all correct. All right, let's try another backwards one. Same setup. We want to know what reaction took place and the starting alkyl halide with the reaction conditions that look like this. We have NaOET with ETOH to give us a product as follows. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to figure out, is it a substitution reaction or elimination reaction? And what is my clue here? If I have a pi bond, it had to be elimination. Pi is from an elimination reaction. So substitution is ruled out. It had to be S, uh, E1 or E2. Then I look at my attacker, Na plus positive spectator. ETO minus strong. If it's strong, it had to be a two type. That means this was an E2 reaction. So part one of this question, was it, what reaction was it? E2. Part two, starting molecule. All right, well, what would be the starting molecule? In elimination, in E2, I don't have a carbocation, therefore I have no carbocation rearrangement. If I look at this molecule, the pi bond is sitting on between the alpha and beta carbon. The question is which one? So I had a leaving group either here or here. This is where it gets tricky. If I look at both options, let's draw them out real quick. If I put a leaving group here, and then I put a leaving group here, and AOET and ETOH is going to follow Zaitsev's rule. That means, whoops, I just did the same thing twice. Let's put one here. If I have this as my starting molecule, the most substituted pi bond for the major product would be right there. That is not what I have. That means this is not my starting molecule. Again, I'm looking to see where that leaving group could have been and then trying to do the problem forward. If the leaving group in that position would have given me a different starting molecule, I'm sorry, a different product, that is not my answer. But this one, the only place I could put a pi bond is where my answer is, and that means that was my starting molecule. I can give it any halogen that I want, so I'll give it a chlorine, because why not? And that's my answer. Question, does the no pi bond equal no elimination apply only to products? Well, it's also to reactants, right? If you have a reaction and you don't form a pi bond, I guess we're still talking about the products. Yeah, because the pi bond is the product of an elimination reaction. So if I don't have a pi bond, I had no elimination reaction. ETO minus is not bulky. So therefore, this would be the Zaitsev product, not the Hoffman product. What I'm using here, the sequence that I'm following, the checklist of figuring out the product is what I teach in my one of my newest YouTube videos, choosing between SN1, SN2, E1, E2 reactions. So if you're not following what I'm doing, make sure you watch that so that you can really understand the pieces because I'm going to continue using that checklist, for example, in this problem. Let's say I have a molecule that looks like this, and I ask you to react it with HCl. 
No solvent given, so we're going to assume something that isn't going to interfere with the reaction. So let's see. Sometimes your professor won't give you a solvent and it's not necessarily implied. But in an acid, you do want to assume mild H2O, but this time I would have to give you something. Let's see. I don't know what you would get here. Let's put CCL4 and H2O. I don't actually remember what professors give you. It's something with H2O because I don't want water to be the attacker. There's going to be well, this is what I want you to show attacking. And so I'm looking at the alkyl chain. Secondary tells me nothing. I have beta carbons, tells me nothing. My attacker, if I have H plus and Cl minus, my attacker is a Cl minus. Cl minus is one of those exceptions to the rule where even though it's negative, it is strong, but it's not as strong and it's only a nucleophile. Cl minus is not going to act as a base because chloride, halogens in general, do not make good bases. That means we rule out the E1 and the E2 reaction. And then, this is where it gets a little tricky. So we have our attacker. Our solvent is this kind of mix is a solvent that is just there. It's not reactive. We already know it's substitution, so it doesn't matter how I evaluate it. But this is what your professors are tricking you on. The leaving group is OH. Is OH going to leave? No. OH minus is a bad leaving group. It's so strong with a negative charge that it will turn around and attack. And this is where we get our slow reaction. This is why I didn't yet rule between SO1 and SN2, because here's what's going to happen. HCl does dissociate in solution, but what we show for the mechanism is that the OH actually attacks that H plus and kicks off the Cl minus. This is going to give me an intermediate, let's actually work our way downward. It's going to give me an intermediate that looks like this, where I have an O, the green hydrogen that it had to begin with, the purple hydrogen that it got from attacking the purple HCl, lone pair, positive charge. Now we turned our bad leaving group into a good leaving group because it's no longer going to be negative and so the entire water molecule breaks off. Now we can see what's going on. I have a carbocation, a water molecule in solution with that purple hydrogen that attacked. And Cl minus, even though it's a good nucleophile, the solvent didn't really let it just be a strong attacker. It was waiting for an opportunity. And the opportunity is now with a carbocation for an SN1 reaction with a chlorine. Do I put it on a dash or a wedge or does it not matter? And if it doesn't matter, why doesn't it matter? Diamond, you are absolutely correct. Mohammed, exactly, we had to bribe it. So the answer is a chiral for a couple of reasons. One, the starting molecule had internal symmetry, so that OH was never chiral to begin with. That wedge was just there to trick you. Second, we had a carbocation intermediate. A carbocation is sp2 hybridized. That means it's trigonal planar or flat. And if we were to get a chiral product, it would have been racemic because it can get attacked from the top or the bottom and therefore it doesn't make a difference. So for those two reasons, the final product is not going to be specifically R or specifically S, but instead this was an SN1 reaction with an A chiral product. Let's try a tricky one that I've seen some professors show you. This time, 
I'm going to give you your starting molecule. I'm going to give you your product and you have to tell me how we got there. It could be more than one step. Hint, hint, it's probably more than one step. While you're thinking about it, I'm looking at the comments. If it were chiral, would we draw two products, one with a CL on a wedge and one on a dash to show racemic? Chloe, absolutely correct. A chiral product with a carbocation intermediate will be racemic, and that means you would have had to show both R and S. For students who joined us late, you'll get a copy of the recording, worksheet, workshop notes if you go to layerforsci.com slash or go live in the pinned comment and sign up to get it as soon as I am done. Question. Since there was an OH and HCl reacting, why is it SN1? Since there is two reactants, wouldn't it be two? I'm not sure I understand your question, but let's quickly review what an SN1 reaction is. The SN1 stands for substitution nucleophilic unimolecular. The unimolecular tells us that it's one at a time. So that means no molecule attacks the other and kicks something out. One at a time. Well, this is an activation step. This is not part of the substitution reaction. This is an acid catalyzed, well, it's an acid catalyzed proton transfer reaction. The carbocation forms because the water leaves and then chlorine attacks one at a time, multiple steps. That is the key characteristic of an SN1 reaction. And your clue is that SN1, oops, thought I was doing red. SN1 and E1 have a carbocation intermediate. SN2 and E2 are going to have no intermediates, no carbocations, no multiple steps. It's just one step, multiple steps. Carbocation and multiple steps. All right, so let's move on to this one. If I have a halogen and I have a halogen, it has to be some kind of substitution reaction. It's not elimination because I have no pi bond in the product. The problem is, if I do an SN1 reaction, that would give me a carbocation intermediate and a racemic product. This is very much not racemic. It's very much one stereoisomer. An SN2 reaction would give me an inversion of chirality. But I have retention of chirality. How do I retain chirality with substitution? Very simple. It's two SN2 reactions. If I do an inversion followed by another inversion, I get what looks like retention. It's the opposite of the opposite. And the way I do that, I see a comment, can I use NaOH first? If I use NaOH, then my intermediate would be an OH which I would have to protonate and get rid of. So the question is, how do I do that? Well, let's see. That's actually the right answer, so let's work it out. The first thing I have to do is get rid of the iodine, and that is very easily accomplished in an SN2 reaction using NaOH and something like DMSO. DMSO ensures that I have an SN2 reaction. I get an inversion of chirality with an OH. Now here's the problem. If I use HCl like before, then I will have a carbocation intermediate and my product is going to be half correct and half incorrect. No good. I need to do another SN2 reaction. At the same time, make sure that I get rid of OH without a carbocation intermediate. This is where it helps to use a tosylate. If I react this with a tosyl chloride in pyridine, 
all I'm doing is turning that OH into a better leaving group. So that O is still there, the H comes off, the tosyl group is attached, and now a very simple Cl- minus is going to kick it out with an SN2 reaction. This SN2 reaction has an inversion. This SN2 reaction has an inversion, and my product appears to have retention as a result. I have seen this come up on quite a few exams and my students were confused, so make sure you recognize this is not retention, it's simply a double inversion. Question, could you have done an E2 reaction? If I did an E2 reaction and got an alkene, alkenes are sp2 hybridized. That means they're flat and can get attacked from the top and bottom and I would not have a retention of chirality. <laughs> Gracie's asking a very good question. It's not overcomplicating it. It's trying to figure out which direction we could go. We're trying to think outside the box here. All right. Speaking of thinking outside the box, let's see what to do if your professor decides to torture you some by giving you a reaction to complete that looks like this. You have a chlorine, and you're told to react it with NaOH. If this is not an acid, your solvent is not implied. So we have our checklist. Let's work through it and see what can happen. Our alkyl chain has the leaving group on a primary carbon that automatically rules out SN1 and E1 because I can't have a carbocation intermediate on a primary carbon. My attacker, Na plus positive spectator, OH minus is a strong base and a strong nucleophile. Is it an SN2 or an E2 reaction? The solvent is not given, and yeah, it's a good leaving group, but I'm stuck between SN2 and E2. I want you to look at the same exact situation because again, your professor wants you to know this difference, even though I'm guessing, let me know in the comments if your professor taught this, because they expect you to know it, but somehow they don't tell you how you're supposed to know it, because they don't teach it. Again, I have Na+, plus, positive spectator, OH- minus as the attacker, no solvent given. What do you think? This is what you're supposed to know. If the solvent is not given, and you're looking just based on the molecule, what you want to recognize is that a primary leaving group is going to prefer SN2 over E2 because this hindrance is so limited, it's so easy for it to get attacked. And that means if you're not given other conditions, you go for the SN2 reaction. But if it's secondary or tertiary, E2 is favored over SN2 because of steric hindrance and it's easier for the molecule to just grab a hydrogen than to go in for the direct nucleophilic attack. And so OH grabs a hydrogen, collapses the electrons down, kicks out the chlorine, and this one gives us, well, this is the major product, but that's the one I'm choosing to show you, the major product, the Zaitsev product, the most stable, most substituted pi bond. All right, wow, it looks like students are still joining us. So welcome everyone who joined us late. As a reminder for a copy of tonight's worksheet, practice worksheet, session notes, and a link to the recording after I'm done, go to the pinned comments, layerforsci.com slash org go live and sign up there so I could send it to you tonight. 
Also, if you're not yet subscribed to my channel, let me know in the comments if you haven't subscribed yet, but you did so right now because I am very excited to get new subscribers at the end of the semester just in time to prepare for finals because I want to make sure you have all the help you can get. That's why I'm doing all of these live streams so close to your final exams. All right, what do you think? Go tricky or go easy on the next one? Hi, Tracy, all the way from Trinidad. Nice. What time is it in Trinidad right now? Unicorn has an exam on this tomorrow. Perfect timing for the review. So just for you, let's go. Let's go slightly tricky. What do you think? Not too hard. Not too easy. We'll take a molecule. You know what? I'll do a warm-up problem, and then we'll go to the hard one. Alright, here's my starting molecule, reacting with NaOET and ETOH. Let's take a look at our checklist and see which reactions we can rule out to see which one takes place. <laughs> Plant Prince says, if I've learned anything in OCHEM, the answer is usually steric hinges. Yeah, that, that's a pretty good rule. Question. If the attacker is both a strong nucleophile and a strong base, and the alkyl is secondary, do SN1, E1 products form? No, if it's strong, you're not going to have SN1, E1, because you're not going to form a carbocation. When the carbocation is so slow and takes forever, it's a rate-limiting step, but the attacker doesn't have the patience to wait. In my video on this, I use the example of a kid on a swing. If there's a little kid on a swing and another kid wants to play on the swing and that kid, say the kid on the swing is five and there's a 10 year old angry bully, he just had a really bad day, he wants to swing, he's not waiting for the five year old to get off. He walks up to the swing, he pushes that five year old, kicks him, yells at him to run away and he takes that swing. That is the SN2E2 reaction. It's not waiting around, but now if there's another five year old who wants to swing, He's not kicking that 10 year old off because that 10 year old is big, strong, and he looks kind of angry. So that little kid is going to wait and wait and wait. And when the big kid finally leaves, that's the leaving group leaving, the carbocation is the empty swing. Now the little kid, the weak attacker, the SN1 E1 reaction, can get on the swing and have his turn. So for this one, let's see. We have the alkyl chain. Secondary tells us nothing, and we do have beta carbons with beta hydrogen, so we could have an E2 reaction, E1, E2 if need be. I kind of gave it away, but let's continue. The attacker is strong and negative. A negative oxygen two-type reaction, rule out SN1 and E1. The solvent is polar protic. That means we're going to favor an E2 reaction. And so the question is, do I grab the blue hydrogen? Or do I grab the purple hydrogen, given that both of them are secondary, and that means they're both going to be equally substituted? Do I go for one secondary over the other? Does it not matter? Do I get a mix of both products? What is going to happen here? We said it's going to be an E2 reaction, and the E2 reaction has to be lined up for the electrons to get kicked out. So instead of memorizing anticoplanar or anything like that, I want you to picture it. I have a hydrogen here. I have a leaving group here. The base is going to come in, grab that hydrogen, and everything collapses into itself, kind of like the dominoes. You ever seen those really cool domino structures where they'll do like different colors to build some kind of like a Mickey Mouse I recently saw, it's so cool. And the dominoes just went around and around knocking each other down. This has to be perfectly lined up so the orbitals can collapse into each other like dominoes and fall over. If I had a leaving group this way, it wouldn't work because the electrons won't line up. This is the idea of anticoplanar. 
If I were to show this to you on a chair confirmation, then it would look something like this. The bromine, we'll call this carbon 1, 2, 3 clockwise, 1, 2, 3 clockwise. Bromine is up on this carbon, and then the blue hydrogen is down on this carbon, the purple hydrogen is up on this carbon. In order to have that domino effect, we need two conditions on a ring. One, they have to be in the axial position, and two, they have to be anti to each other. They cannot be facing, these are sin to each other, facing in the same direction, no good. They have to be anti. And so what we're looking at is only the blue hydrogen can get eliminated, not the purple one, because the purple one is sin. Now, on your exam, I do not want you wasting time drawing this out. You don't have that kind of time. The trick to look out for on the ring is they have to be trans and axial, or if you don't have it in a chair, just look trans. If bromine is on a wedge, which hydrogen is trans? The blue one. And that is how, without bothering to draw a chair, you easily come up with your product that looks like this. Bromine, your alpha carbon's leaving group is gone. The methyl is now on an sp2 carbon, so it's flat. And the purple ethyl group hasn't changed because nothing reacted over there. And the reason why it has to be axial is if bromine was equatorial, you couldn't get this situation where it's perfectly lined up so that the orbitals can be collapsing into each other. Chloe, let me know if that makes sense. And that's why we have this right here as our product. So with this in mind, let's do another tricky question. You have to come up with a starting molecule for this one, knowing that you reacted the molecule, an alkyl halide, with NaOC, that's not a C, NaOCH3 in CH3OH, and you got the following as your only product. What is your starting molecule? Okay, while you're thinking about it, why is the CH3 flat here? Very good question. In the starting molecule, the CH3 sits on an sp3 hybridized carbon. sp3 is tetrahedral. It's three-dimensional, and that's why we have dashes and wedges. But once we have a pi bond, that's an sp2 carbon. sp2 is trigonal planar, or in simple English, flat, and that means we don't have a dash or a wedge. It's a straight line in the plane of the page. Question. Oh, we still have questions on that one, so let me not keep jumping to the next one. Couldn't we assume br bromine is equatorial up and the adjacent H would be equatorial down? No, no, it can't be equatorial. So what I want you to do for homework, Chloe, go to my chair, my Newman projection of chair confirmation video. And you know what? I'm actually going to link that to you. Um, email the Newman of chair. I will send you that video with the recording for tonight. And... I want you to watch that video to see what happens if you set it up equatorial in terms of trying to line them up like this. That will give you the answer when you can clearly see why they don't line up. Don't take my word for it. Prove it to yourself by looking at it so you can see why they don't line up and then hopefully that will make sense. So that goes to anyone who was wondering because that is a trick question. All right, so let's take a look at this one right here. I have to figure out what's going on. I have a pi bond, that means it had to have been 
an elimination reaction, so E1 or E2, not SO1 or SN2. Na positive spectator, OCH3 minus, strong attacker, it's an E2 reaction. The question is, what was my starting molecule? Did I have an alkyl halide here or here? Uh, the leaving group specifically, there or there. So what you want to do is consider what it would look like in each situation. And this right here is my only product. It's not that we have a mix. So if that's my only product, and this is my t-butte, t-butte being tert-butyl, and that's my t-butte, if I had a leaving group here, or here. The question is, what could have happened? Well, if it's this one, I could have had an elimination here or here, but I told you only product. If it's this one, you'd think I could have an elimination here or here. The fact that this is my only product, and these look like equal probability, means that this isn't it, because if it was, I would have two products. So then the question is, what is it about the tert butyl that makes this product, let me change it, that makes this one, the green one, not able to happen? Very simple. What do you know about a ring flip when you have a tert butyl group present? Tert butyl group locks the ring into place. It can only be in an equatorial position. So if I draw this out and I have my tert butyl, actually I want to draw the other ring. If I draw it out like this, no, I just drew the same one twice. I'm trying to draw this one. There we go. Axial up would be here. That's no, or is that the one I draw first? I don't know, it doesn't matter. We'll just do this one. Axial up would be no good. Tert butyl will not go in the axial up position. So tert butyl would have to go here. If tert butyl is in this position, and that is carbon one, then that is carbon two. Where would I have to put the chlorine to get carbon two? I would have to put the chlorine on this one. But the question is, well, it has to be in the up position. If it's in the up position, that hydrogen can actually be eliminated. So I ruled out the wrong one. That can't happen because then I would have gotten two products. Do you see how I could just eliminate right there? Because chlorine has to be in the up position. So let's go back then to the other one. Actually, I'm going to leave this here so you can see why I ruled it out. And then we'll draw this one. So let me uncross out that one. I jumped to conclusions there. I made up this problem without fully thinking it through, so that's why I'm thinking it through now with you. If we instead move the chlorine to this position and put it axial, no, because then we could have two products. Because then I could take this one, or I can take this one. Okay, so that is not your only product because we would have two. Yeah, we could have both. Okay, um, I outsmarted myself in this problem. I sometimes draw the problems and don't solve it. I just solve them live with you. So my notes is just a series of open-ended problems that I solve with you. And I talked myself into a corner here. 
So disregard, it's not your only product. You can have quite a few starting material. And the key then is to know if you're putting the chlorine up or down. And so if I'm going to put it on this position, it has to be on a wedge. As I showed you, if it's this one, it has to be on a wedge because it, if it's on dashes, if it's down, it's equatorial, that wouldn't work. And if it's in this position, it has to be down. So the stereochemistry matters. It would have to be down because I need to be able to do a transaxial elimination. So let me show you the starting molecules. I know I was kind of thinking in circles out loud, so let me know if anything that I just worked through was not clear. But my only options for a starting molecule would be a chlorine or whatever halogen in the up position here or in the down position here, but it has to be this way. This cannot be on a wedge and this cannot be on dashes. Two starting products. So again, why I didn't put chlorine down is because it has to be axial to do the attack. And if I did it down, that's equatorial. And for this position, if I did it up, that's also equatorial. So this is the only option for axial, and here only option for axial. All right, let's say we do one more big tricky question to end the session tonight. But before we jump into that, remember recording, worksheet, notes in the pinned comments, layerforsci.com slash or go live. Also, if, this, if you're interested in these kinds of sessions and you want to see, you want me to teach you every topic, just breaking it down, every single topic from Orgo 1 or Orgo 2, go to my website, come join me in the study hall. So layerforsci.com slash join. That's where you can join my organic chemistry community where you'll have all the videos on Orga 1 in depth, start to finish, not like the YouTube videos that are short, but kind of like this in on every topic from beginner, intermediate, and advanced, as well as our private members only community where you can ask your daily study questions, interact with other members, and get help and support every step of the way. The link is layerforsci.com slash join. And let's end with something that I got a lot of questions on on a recent YouTube video. So let's work it out together. Let's use iodine because I haven't really been using that much today. And we're going to react this with H2SO4. For the checklist, as a reminder, we have the alkyl chain the attacker, solvent, and leaving group. My alkyl chain, leaving group is on a secondary carbon. It doesn't tell me anything, so useless. By the way, if your professor gives you a secondary leaving group, they're not being very nice. Primary and tertiary are very easy to rule things out. So you want to, you ideally want primary and tertiary. The attacker is not given, remember, H plus, H2SO4 is simply a source of H plus in solution. Water is implied. So remember that you do have water here as your attacker, solvolysis, and as your solvent. Finally, the leaving group iodine is a good leaving group. What is the product going to be? It's going to be a mix of SO1 and E1. Am I going to have a five membered ring in my product? Well, let's find out. Step one, iodine is the leaving group is going to leave. That will give me a carbocation in, wow, that ring looks drunk. Let's try that again. This is where it gets interesting. I have a secondary carbocation near a tertiary carbon. It looks like I would have a hydride shift, but no, it's going to be a ring expansion because if I have a five-membered ring and the ability to make it more stable as a six-membered ring, 
I am definitely getting a bigger ring. And that bigger ring is going to be a little bit tricky, so let's number everything. We'll call this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And the new bond is now going to happen between carbons two and seven. That means I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right there. The pi bond broke and carbon three lost the pi bond. So carbon three is my carbocation. Now I can say secondary carbocation near a tertiary carbon. Yeah, we're still going to have a hydride shift. So this hydride is going to go down to carbon number three to give me a completely unexpected intermediate with a carbocation at the tertiary position of a six-membered ring. And now, just like you saw in the previous example, I have the option of water attacking directly for the SN1 product with a deprotonation step, which we already saw before how to do to give me an alcohol. And then the other option is to grab the hydrogen for the elimination product. And that will give me another unexpected product. All right. For even more practice on this, in the study hall, I have two recent sessions that I did. One is about an hour and change workshop on how to choose between SN1, SN2, E1, E2 reactions. So basically the explanation behind what I did here for an entire lengthy session. There's also a lot more practice 